Well, today's lecture is on creativity. Now, creativity, originality, novelty are words that our society tends to value. And I'm going to have to distinguish to some extent between the meanings of those words. Now, before I go too far farther, I should tell you that primitive tribes don't appreciate originality, creativity, and novelty. You are supposed to do what the elders in the tribe always did do. Now, that is not too different in a good many large organizations. Management knows how things should be done, and young people who come around want to do it differently are not always appreciated. It's got the same reasons in primitive tribes as in corporations, but it's obvious also that we do value these things and we do expect to have people creative. One of the purposes of this talk is to increase the chance that you'll be a creative person. Now, long ago, a friend of mine said he'd like to use a computing machine to do something no one had ever done. I thought a moment and said, hmm, why don't you take a 10-digit number, multiply by another 10-digit number, and it's almost certain that product has never been calculated. And you can do some back-of-the-envelope calculation and decide that I'm right. A random product of two 10-digit numbers has probably not been calculated. But while you have to agree it's new, it wasn't what he wanted. He said well, he'd rather do something like find the biggest prime number. So it would go in Guinness's Book of Records for a little while. Well, what's the difference? One thing is we expect that something getting in a book of records is either very hard to do or it's a remarkable coincidence. Easy things to do don't usually rate as records, and picking a random product is not exactly hard to do. Finding the biggest prime number is rather hard to do, so there is a difference between them. Some difficulty in doing it seems to be one of the things we talk about. Evidently, not done before doesn't really count. It's got to have more than that. Now, this is a problem that modern art has grappled with. I assume you're all familiar with some modern art, and you've seen it, and the art galleries have grappled with it. I can clearly paint a picture and it will be novel and new and different, but it won't be great art. Whether what they produce in the art galleries for modern art now is art or not is up to your opinion. It's a difficult question. There used to be a time when there were agreed upon canons of art, but there have always been changes, and it's very difficult to cope with. Particularly in art where you know the history, you are well aware that various artists died miserably in poverty, and they couldn't sell their pictures, and now the pictures will sell for millions of dollars. It's a common phenomenon. It's so common as being discouraging. Well, a great many artists use this in what is called the uh, Robert Fulton complex. Fulton tried to build a steamboat, and everybody called it Fulton's Folly. Well, it ran. The argument goes, they laughed at Fulton, and they were wrong, they're laughing at me, therefore they're wrong, and I'm a great artist. It's a very common argument given. But obviously it's not legitimate reasoning at all. Well, you're going to say, well, if it's going to be something important, it must be widely appreciated. Let me take a new theorem in some branch of mathematics. An important theorem, shall we say. It may be only ten people in the world can appreciate it that moment. So I can't go around and saying it's got to be understood by many, many people. Significant contribution we made at a time when very few people understand it. In fact, you remember for a while it was maintained that only 10 people in the world who understood relativity. And yet it was regarded as important contribution. So breadth of understanding will not do the trick of telling you one good thing from a bad thing. In women's fashions, I've decided, after watching Vogue magazine for many years, 
that uh, fashion is the ladies' clothes should be different, but not too different. And this is what we often mean. It should be different, but not too different. But I cannot tell you the differences. You see in art alone the great problem of the difference. Now in ballet you will see that uh, ballet still retains some classical ballet and some very modern, quite different ballet. Uh, one form has grown another, but it's not discarded the old version. Among the modern art you will find very few people pa painting in the style of the Renaissance. Now I think I told you in uh, 1838 a guy named Dick wrote a book in, in which continental drift occurs. And in 1905 or something like that, Wegner wrote a book roughly on continental drift. These were ignored by the experts until after the Second World War when they could find a mechanism. They really literally saw the ocean splitting and they could see the magnetic ripples on both sides to convince themselves that in fact, the continental drift occurred. Now, they had plenty of other evidence earlier. The biologists had had to make uh, Gondwana land and uh, some other one so they could account for why various species on widely remote continents resembled each other. They had, some people invoked land bridges, but the land bridges weren't visible, so who could believe in those? But it's true that the scientists have not done so much better than have the artists. You know uh, uh, Mendel, he did the work, published, and it was ignored. In 1900, three different people found the same sort of phenomena, but connected with fruit flies and other subjects, and then they found out Mendel had done it first. Well, in Mendel's case, we generally give Mendel credit for having started genetics, even if it didn't. <laughs> but we don't generally give Dick credit for having started the continental drift. So you can't tell how it's going to come out. We all have our feelings recognizing new things very badly. Now in discussing creativity one time, a friend of mine said if he took results from three different fields which were well developed and put them together, that would be a great contribution. And after thinking over a while, I had to agree it would be. And I can give you a simple example from my own experience. At Bell Labs, the expert who had written a very thick book, very thick book on magnetics, came to me with a problem, and one thing or another, we worked on it back and forth, and finally, due to contributions of my own, uh, we got the thing really worked out well. And so he wrote the whole thing up and put his name and my name on it, and it came down to me to sign because you couldn't get a release without my signature. I went down to a very shrewd physicist friend of mine who I had great respect for, and said, "Look." I cannot put my name to a paper in which my contribution was simply applying least squares. That's all I really did. He said, Hamming, my most requested reprints in, new, in uh, solid state physics was for a paper in which I simply applied network theory, circuit theory, to the problem. Sign it and let it go ahead, he said. It's new in their field, they aren't used to it, so just sign and let it go, and so I did. I merely applied well-known techniques in one area to a different area. And apparently the expert in the field thought it was worthwhile, and other people thought it was worthwhile publishing. I still have my reservations about the matter. Now, creativity should be usefulness, the problem of creativity also involves what I would call the psychological distance. How difficult it is to associate two things together. How difficult it was it for me, in error correcting codes, to say, I really want the mathematics one plus one is zero. How difficult is it? Once told, it's very easy. Much of creativity is, in fact, bringing things which are psychologically far apart and bringing them together and saying, look, they are related. This is all we're really doing. And often is a basis of a great contribution. Well, I don't know what creativity is. I can't say it. I'm convinced I cannot put it into words. In fact, if you want, the whole book is devoted to creativity or if you want style. 
I became convinced that people are not taught enough about how to do engineering. There's lots of able engineers out there, and they never really do anything great. Why can't they? Why can't they be trained to do great things? And so I set out to try and do some about this course is really an attempt to get you to think in more creative ways, make bigger contributions than you would if you just go along the same old rut. Well, if I can't say it, why am I writing about it or talking about it? Well, because you'll find lots of books out there on the subject, and I'm convinced the bulk of them who write the book never did a creative act. And I figure it's better I should try to tell you what creativity is about, because you know I've done it, than to have somebody who never did it tell you. Because I think frequently creativity is something like sex. You can tell a boy of 14 all about sex. You can give any number of books. He can read all he wants to. But you have a suspicion he isn't going to understand sex until he's become involved in himself. And even then he may still not know it. There are things which you can talk about and read, but you have to experience. And I think creativity is one of those things you really need to experience. And the best I've been able to do is to tell you stories about myself so you will vicariously experience creativity. This is why I've talked so much about myself. The attempt to get you to see and experience to some extent what creativity is. So you've got a better chance of doing it. Now, introspection, which was frowned on for a long while in psychology, but has come back into favor, is one of the things you can do about studying creativity. And I learned somewhere in the early years of Bell Labs, when I'd done something creative, stop and look and ask myself immediately, why? How did it happen? Now, as in sports, you don't keep that in mind while you're doing it. You don't keep in mind just how I had a baseball bat while you're batting. You practice. But when you're up at bat, you just swing. In the same way you're doing creative work, you just do it. And then you look back and see. And you ask yourself, how could I have done it? Or how should I have done it? But you can't really think about that at the same time you're doing creative. So I've only got memory back from what happens. Nevertheless, all the reports say, uh, it suddenly appeared in my mind. I recall telling you that uh, the error correcting codes, I couldn't tell you why I suddenly thought about a triangle code. Frequently, you cannot say what made you think of this little thing, but there it is suddenly. You can rationalize it afterwards and say, well, I should have thought of it because so and so and so and so, but it may not be true. Well, if it comes out to subconscious, and by and large, I would say all the people who talked about creativity, except a few people who think you can manage it and uh, just practice it mechanically, most of them say it comes out to subconscious somehow or other. Well, what do you know about your subconscious? Not much. The main clue you have is your own dreams. They're clearly what you mean by the subconscious. One thing you notice is that particularly when you're young, the dreams elements come out of events that happened recently. Not exactly the same, they're distorted. But many things are somewhat related to episodes that you have had in the past couple of days. Well, if the subconscious works on that, what can you do? <laughs> a very simple thing, which I've advocated to you several times already. You think about the problem you want to solve. And you think about it. And you think about it. And your subconscious hasn't got anything else to think about when it goes to bed, when you go to bed and go to sleep. You saturate your subconscious with the problem. You haven't let your subconscious get much else. And so while you're happily sleeping, it's got to work on your problem. And maybe in the morning, there it is. See, one of the few ways I know of managing my subconscious is simply saturation. Now, this is what Newton said. If other people minded it as much as I did, they would do similar things. And this is really why I say Pasteur's remark, luck favors prepared mind. The person who's thought about it constantly is more likely to find the answer than the person who has not. Because the person who's thought about it a lot very intently, finds his subconscious delivering the goods later on because his subconscious couldn't do anything else. So that's one way of managing it. Of course you have to do other things. You have to eat, sleep, and so on. But you keep your mind more or less intently involved in that one thing. You keep the high emotional content of the day on that problem, and you don't let other things get in the way. And then you can manage sometimes to come up with it. But if you can't, 
then the persistence doesn't work. After a reasonable length of time, and I can't tell you just what reasonable is at the moment, you set it aside and go do something else. And sometimes, left alone, the subconscious will still deliver the answer weeks later when you haven't been thinking about it. Sometimes you have to bring the problem again and go at it. But this monomaniacal pursuit of an idea, intently, week after week after week, seldom results. Now, a classic example of the dream business helping you out is Kekulé, the chemist. He dreamed about snakes biting their own tails and rolling in hoops down a hill. He thought about it a little while and said, oh, yes, <laughs> that's really the carbon atoms in a, root, in a cycle. That's where the idea of the carbon atoms form a ring came from Kekulé's dream of the snakes biting their tail and rolling down a hoop. He saw a connection between his problem and what he dreamed of. And this is a characteristic of dreams. They don't give it to you right square out sometimes. You have to see what the dream is telling you. But I want to dwell on the emotional content, importance of it. If you don't have emotional content, it doesn't happen. I dwell on it when I was talking about error correcting codes, I've said it other times. It's partly because I have a friend at Bell Labs who is a very, very good mathematician, very skillful, very able. But he went home and played the guitar. He did very good work, but not the best, very best. Yet he could have, I think. But he was never emotionally involved heavily the way some of us were. And by and large, those who care greatly are more likely to do something than those who don't care greatly. Emotional involvement is one of the things necessary. But it's the same thing I told you, keeping your mind saturated with it. Those are different ways of saying the same thing. Now, sometimes you get an answer, and you're sure it's the answer, and you work a little further, and you find it's no good at all. Well, fine. Go back to the drawing board. Except you now know what you don't have, can't do. You know that that path doesn't work. You know more of things not to do, so you have a more focused view. Another thing you can do, which I often do, is when I'm stuck, I ask myself, what would an answer look like if I had it? Are there conservation of energy laws? Is there conservation of momentum? What would an answer look like if I had it? This also helps you greatly to solve the problem. Another thing you do is, have I got all the information? What does it really depend upon? Must I really know the position of the Earth when I'm trying to calculate the satellites of Jupiter, or do I not need to know that? And what effect has the position of the Earth got on the timing of the satellite Jupiters? Well, Romer found the velocity of light that way. You have to ask all kinds of questions. Now, false starts and false solutions are common. But finally you have an answer. But you found your answer in your own quaint way. And it's peculiar to you. And you find you have trouble saying it. And you also find the explanation don't make much sense to other people. So you have to rework the idea for fitting other people. For example, uh, Maxwell's equations. Maxwell originally derived them using all kinds of gear trains and everything else, a very wild mechanical model. That's how he found them. But he gradually stripped out all the nonsense and gave you the equations directly without the mechanical model he had behind it. And that's often necessary to clean up your idea, remove the nonsense, remove the unimportant parts, and in the process you will often understand the problem much better yourself by removing the irrelevant material. For example, you assume the function is continuous, and you look at the proof, and you say, hmm, where in the proof did I use continuity? Well, I didn't. Well, then why did I assume continuity? I don't have to. That kind of a thing happens continually as you strip down the idea once you've got a solution. And you gradually come up with a clean solution, you publish it finally. Now, probably the most useful thing in creativity is analogy. This is like that. This is like that. Maxwell was thinking about a bunch of gear trains when he thought about how things might work. And he finally decided the gear trains were irrelevant, but that's how he got there. Now, you may think that the analogy has to be close, but frequently the analogy is very, very loose and weak. It's just a suggestion 
oh, that reminds me of how it works over there. Yes, like that. But of course, it's different. This is sort of like that, and that's like that. But you know, that corresponds to that. Ah, I see what to do next. It happens that way frequently. And very loose analogies, like the snake biting his tail. Loose analogies like that will often get you there. Very good ones. Uh, not too often it happens. If you had an exact analogy, then you didn't have something new. You had the same old thing again. There's always bound to be some difference. But analogy is one of the things we work on. So how can we do this? Well, I worked with John Tukey for many years. You've heard his name many times now. He was clearly a genius, and he used to infuriate me frequently. We'd be doing something, he'd say, well, you know about uh, polarized light. Well, yeah, I know about polarized light, but it didn't occur to me to think in a situation where I were in radar that that would be relevant. When he says it, I see it. Why didn't I think of it? Well, I've spent a lot of years on it. Why was he so able to do it and I wasn't? Partly, of course, he was smarter than I was. But partly, he had done something I had not done. Up until then, I had learned things in the framework in which I'd learned them in. I saw that when he learned something in the act of learning, he asked himself, what other things does it look like? In other words, he put little hooks on the idea so it had many ways of being recalled. I could only recall the framework in which I learned it. You see the difference? If one you're in the act of learning, you simply learn in the framework in which you're told, you can recover it in that framework. But if you think it over yourself and turn it over and associate it with many other things in your mind, then when the time comes to recall it, there are many more hooks and you can pull up the fish the other guy misses. And this is what John did. Now, I started doing that. I started saying, well, I learned something. Let me stop and think. And that's why I told you about digital filters. I told you how I went at it rather differently. I said, what is basic going on? What are fundamental? How is this like that? I told you a story of how walking out of my office and saying, oh, I know how to kill diffraction, uh, Gibbs phenomena. Down a couple of stories, two or three flights and across a bit. I say, oh, that's nothing else than diffraction. I go a little further and say, ah. Huh, that's diffraction like from a microscope because that's where I'm headed for. So I have gradually learned to do these kind of things. And that's why I say several times to you, that which you learn from others, you can learn to follow. That which you learn for yourself, you can learn to lead. You have to decide when you learn things to think them over in the act of learning and look at them many different ways. And then you'll have this lovely ability to recall a relevant thing to the situation you have. As sense as I was with early days with John Tukey, what he told me I knew, but until he told me I didn't. And as I say, that infuriated me. I didn't like that once or twice I don't mind, but when this happens ten times a year, uh, you do get rather infuriated being so stupid. Now many books have been written on the topic of creativity. There are whole talks, seminars, everything else. There was, uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago, a uh, business of brainstorming. You assemble a bunch of people, and they all brainstorm ideas idea without regard to details. They just think of wonderful thoughts. And it was supposed to produce great ideas. Now, we've all had the experience, I think, you probably have too, of talking with a friend or two about something, and what I'll call batting idea around, and out of that comes some insight. But it appears these scheduled creativity sessions of brainstorming did not work very well because they've been pretty well abandoned. They just don't work, not scheduled. On the other hand, talking your ideas over to friends is a help. I find when I have an idea, I often go down the hall and explain it to my friends. In the act of explaining, I have to remove some of this confusion and get it in a cleaner, neater form. And sometimes, if you pick your friends well, they say, oh yeah, that's just like so-and-so. And then you've got another clue what to do. I've always searched wherever it was to find those people who would stimulate me to think better. Who are the people to whom I told something, they would say something back instead of, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Doesn't help you a bit. 
What you want is a person who's going to say, yes, that reminds me of so-and-so, or that's sort of like so-and-so, or I remember that happened back in all eight. You seek those people out. You find those are the people you go to lunch with. You avoid the other people. You pick your friends so they will stimulate you to think. You don't pick them necessarily for their polite, nice people. You pick them for the ability to stimulate. And several of the people I found most stimulating were, as people, awkward, difficult people to get along with. But if they will stimulate you to good ideas, they're beautiful. And if they don't, they're not. Now, back to this topic mainly. Can we teach creativity? I think the answer is both yes and no. I would not have devoted this lecture, I would not have devoted the whole course to it if I did not think I could do something about it. But it's the analogy I've used many times. If you want to run the four minute mile, you have to do the work. I have to get you to change yourself. I have to get you to change yourself. Physical habits you're familiar with. You put your left shoe on before the right shoe or this or that, the other thing, they're necessary. But you have mental habits which are just about as rigid. You habitually think this way and that way. I have somehow or other to get you to break down these things and think in new ways, to accept new ideas, to search for them, to prepare yourself to find them. In short, my job is to change you and how you think. And the only way I've known it is the method I've used. I tell you stories that you more or less have to believe because I tell them about myself. If I told them about somebody else, they would not have the effect. I told you this is the first lecture, I'm telling you again. The necessity of lecture on direct experience is overwhelming if you're going to try and teach art. A person teaching painting can show how they'd paint, and they can remark, well, da Vinci's painting was so-and-so, but when the artist said, well, I'd paint it this way, why don't you put something in like this? it's more convincing when you see it done in front of your face. So I've done this. I've tried very hard to get underneath your skin, and I'm going to work on it further before we're through, trying to get you to change your ways. Now, in planning to change, you have to know yourself. It's very easy to promise reformation. I've promised reformation myself many times. Lots of times I've failed. You know how difficult it is. Anybody who's going on a diet knows how difficult it is to stick to it, or quitting smoking, or something else. It's not easy to change a habit. Nevertheless, people do. People do succeed in going on a diet and keeping their weight down. People do quit smoking. People do change things. You can change your mental habits the same way as you can change your physical habits, provided you set down and start working on a project. But it isn't going to be easy. And it's better to practice on small steps and assume impossible ones and become discouraged. Frequently, people who start dieting want to lose 10 pounds the first five minutes. And of course, they don't, and they get discouraged. Same way. You have to pick small things and try and change small things and gradually build up a different pattern of thinking, a different way of living your mental life, and then you can be more creative than you have been. Now, in order to do this, I have to really get down to something. I've said it once or twice only in the course. You have to take charge of yourself. You're responsible for yourself. You're responsible for the way you behave. You're responsible for the way you think. You're responsible for yourself. You have to change yourself. You have to make yourself in the person you want to be. And one of the things I've watched in my own life a lot, do I want to be that kind of a person? No. Then don't behave that way. For example, do I want to be a liar? No. Then don't tell lies. If you don't want to be a liar, then don't start telling lies. When you find yourself telling a lie, hey, I was not going to be a liar. That's not right. i got to stop it. You have to stop a lot of things and start a bunch of other ones. You are responsible for yourself. And that's the thing I've got to get you to realize more than you have. You are the one who must change yourself in this matter of creativity. I can't do anything about it. Now, I have not talked about a delicate topic. That is dropping a problem. If you pick up problems and work on them and you get success, it's fine. You work one after another, another. But if you can't drop problems, the first time you meet a bad problem, that's the end. 
you'll never get it solved. And the classic example is our boy Al Einstein. He had lots of good ideas. He produced a lot of things. But once he hits unified field theory, the second half of his life went down the drain of that problem and he didn't get anything. It was the wrong problem at the wrong time and in the wrong way. Not that it will not perhaps be a unified field theory, I don't know. But half his life went on a problem which he got nothing for it. Perhaps the most creative physicist we ever had in many respects. Now, I've often argued that Oppenheimer at the Institute should have called Einstein into his office and said, Al, old boy, do me a favor, will you? Drop that unified field stuff for six months a year and work on anything else at all, but just drop that. Just do me a favor and do that. Would Al have been able to do it? I'm inclined to think he could have. But who thinks they got enough ner nerve to tell Einstein how to run his own business? Oppenheim might have, but he did, as far as I know. I've sometimes thought he, Einstein could have been saved. On several occasions at Bell Labs, I've been asked to do that kind of a job. One of them, which is a failure, I can remember distinctly. This man thought, well, he was working on nonlinear filters. Now, lin nonlinear filter is everything. With no restriction on it, it's everything. It's like looking at the moon and a falling apple and say, oh, gravity, common thing. That's nonlinear filter. Huh, you aren't going to build one. Well, he had the characteristic syndrome. He was going to get the results in 18 months. He'd made some progress a while along the way, but he thought he might get there finally in 18 months. A year passes, and he's made some more progress, but he'll get there in another 18 months. That's a very characteristic syndrome. You've got an idea, you're working on it, but you're, the solution always receding, is receding, receding, at about a fixed distance. It's not a guarantee, but it's a suggestion. You have the wrong problem. And if you don't drop it, that goes the rest of your career. On the other hand, if you drop problems too soon, somebody else comes by and does it. It all comes down to one of my favorite expressions. The difference between strong-willed and stubborn. George Washington was strong-willed. Had he lost the revolution, he would have been stubborn. It's a small, thin thing. But it's essential that you understand when to drop a problem. I think I've told you some cases the other day, I would think about it. I thought of how many times I have walked off from a problem which looked too hard to do at that moment and go off and done something else. Then later on other people did it, fine, I'm glad they did. I couldn't because the working circumstances which I had were inadequate to the problem. Now, the working circumstances is very common. You may think you haven't got the right working conditions. Very common thing for creativity. Forget it. What the average person thinks is good for creativity is not. And the evidence I will give you is the Institute for Advanced Study. There you're given a lifetime appointment, more than adequate salary, beautiful restaurants and beautiful offices and everything else. Everything is laid on. If you compare what the people at the Institute did before they got there and what they did afterwards, I think you'll agree with me, the Institute has killed more good people than any place else has ever created. Ideal work conditions, what you think are ideal, are not. Frequently very unpleasant work conditions are the ones that will stimulate you. So don't give me the excuse, uh, well, I can't work in a problem I have ideal working conditions. When you get ideal work conditions, you probably will not find the answer. It's done under difficult circumstances. Now, one of the methods I've managed myself with, I think it works very well on me, I'm not saying it work on you, is what I call the cornered rat theory. It's based on two principles which you know about me. I'm rather egotistical. I don't like being wrong. At the same time, I got a fair amount of self-confidence. So, Thursday, I say, well, I'll have the answer for you Monday. Sunday afternoon is coming by, and Monday morning will be around pretty soon, and I haven't got an answer. I start thinking about it. Well, Monday night, I still haven't got the answer, and I start really, because I don't want to walk in Monday morning and say I haven't got the answer. 
So, like a cornered rat, more often than not, I've risen to heights of effort and produced an answer. I would not have done it if I had not promised I'll have it to you by Monday. I manage myself, I manage to convert what I consider a couple of character defects in many respects in me into an asset. I used myself. I deliberately would promise people answers when I didn't know how I was going to do it because experience taught me that was the way I would be much more creative than if I said, well, I'll see if I can get you an answer. <laughs> if I promise I'll see if I can get you an answer, uh, maybe I'll get a Wednesday, maybe I'll forget it by then, something else. But what I promise I'll have it Monday morning, and Monday morning is a good time to do it because you've got the weekend to start working on it. Monday morning is a very good time to promise an answer. I'll be in your office at 10 o'clock with the answer. It powerfully makes you think Saturday, Sunday night and Saturday night. If you've got those attributes I have, that's one way of managing yourself. If you haven't, then you have to find some other ones. But you have to know yourself to manage yourself. And I'm coming back to this expression I said, you have to take responsibility for yourself. You have to understand yourself what you can and cannot do. I should also tell you the circumstance of changing things, which you are very favorably placed. When I went out to Nebraska to graduate school, I was going out where I knew no one. In those days, you took a train because airplanes weren't very much. And on the way out, I thought about myself. And I thought I had had a quick, smart answer for a lot of things. I was a very clever, quick-witted guy. Well, when you do those things, nine times out of ten is funny, but the tenth time, it's only funny, but it hurts the other guy's feelings a lot. I think you know it. These people have a quick answer. Sometimes the answer is really painful, but it's funny, so you have to laugh, but it isn't good. I thought more, and I realized I had lots of acquaintances, but no really close friends. And with a long trip out there by train from Chicago to Lincoln, Nebraska, plenty of time to think, I decided, you know, it's because you had this snotty quick answer that you've gotten yourself in trouble and you've lost friends because sooner or later you're going to say something which is going to hurt their feelings. Uh, they'll gradually drift off. So I decided I would reform. Going to a place where no one knew me, no one turned to me and expect me to make a quick remark. In among friends, you are expected to behave the same. When you move to a new situation, you have a better chance of changing your behavior pattern than you have in a fixed static situation. And since you people get moved around a lot, you have more opportunities than most of us have for deciding I am going to change some aspect of myself. You have built in opportunities to do it, which I had far fewer than you did. After all, 30 years at Bell Labs and 20 years here isn't exactly a lot of changing around much. It's pretty well fixed in a rut. Nevertheless, you can do this. And I say that when you change situations, that is one of the best times you can change yourself because you no longer are automatically expect to behave the way you have, and so you can behave differently. And that includes not only physical, material things, but also ways of thinking. If you get a reputation for having answers in a new situation, then people will turn to you. At Bell Labs, I had a reputation for solving analytic integration of all kinds. The whole labs, when I got really stuck, would call me up and say, I got an integral here. I hear you can do something. And I would say, yes, tell it to me over the phone. And uh, I'll copy down the repeat, but got it right. Well, I'll see what I can do. I'll get the phone number and see what I can do. I got enormous practice in that. Now you can have a machine do it, but those days we didn't. There were people around Bell Labs, people you knew. For example, I knew two people who really knew Bessel functions very well. And when I got stuck, I either went to Miss Gray or a guy named S.O. Rice, and they could tell me all about Bessel functions. I have other people I knew, gradually knew various things. As I stayed in the organization, I knew to whom to go. They build a reputation. Well, how do you build a reputation for giving answers of a given kind? I think in the back end, I had a reputation for the following. When nobody knows what to do at all, then you will call Hamming. He is probably best when he, nobody knows anything. When we don't know what to do at all, when we're totally lost, 
Hamming somehow or other can do something in those situations where other people are stuck. So I think that's the reputation I had. And certainly that was the way I work, probably worked best. You would have other traits. What are your best traits? Emphasize those, get a reputation for it, and bingo, there you are. You're known as a person who does these kind of things. What kind of things you want to be known to be able to do? That you can do. Now, there's no use wanting to do some things you cannot do. At all. I mean, if you're one arm, you can't become a great juggler. Uh, you've got some other physical defects, there's things you cannot do. Uh, Likewise, mentally, if you've got some peculiar features. Now, if you've got features, I told you about mine. I told you, confessing it. I got egotism that was pretty big, and I got great self-confidence. I turned around and used those things for my advantage. You need to study yourself, take charge of yourself, and find out what the heck is going on, and go do it. Now, I have to say a couple of things about careers. In mathematics, theoretical physics, and astrophysics, in the past, the best work was done by the person very young. Newton, after all, got much of his stuff on a, during the plague when he was sent home from Cambridge and went back to Woolsorp, where his mother was, and he spent time on a farm thinking for 18 months. The plague ran around, so most of his ideas are traceable directly to that period. Most great scientists, their best work was done surprisingly young. Now, on the other hand, on music composition, politics, and novel writing, often the last is best. We value the last compositions of many of the great composers. That doesn't mean the composers did. The composers sometimes like some early composition that other people don't like. That They like it because it was to them something of a breakthrough. People don't see it that way. So in some fields, maturity is the best thing. But it is astrophysics, mathematics, and uh, theoretical physics, where raw creativity counts, youth is a great advantage and experience is not. Other fields are different. I don't know about your field. I can also say in the past. Now, there are a few exceptions. Virus Strauss in mathematics taught high school for years and years and years, and he finally got to college and became highly creative later on. There are one or two examples in mathematics where the creativity was late in life, but by and large it's very young. If you want to go in a field like uh, mathematics uh, and you're 40, forget it. You're not going to do much. What did I do in my career? Well, let's tell you a couple of two stories. After I came here, Bell Labs produced a sheet of paper like that, roll up and roll, with 10 columns across and down by the ear great contributions, research across. Well, I unrolled it, looked at it. Boy, was I good. I was connected with a lot of things. I may not have invented transistor, but there I was helping the bastards and so on. Boy, I was really good. So because it's rolled up tight, I scotch tape it on my office door so I could read it, look at it. And I come in and look at it, admire it. I come in one day and look. Everything the historians marked down that I did was important or connected with important things was in the first 15 years. There wasn't a single important thing in the last 15 years they marked that I could say I was reasonably closely associated with. Needless to say, I tore off the door and threw it in a wastebasket. But that's how historians judge my work. I knew this age business. What can you do? You can do what I did and what ballet dancers do and athletes. When you're no longer going to do it because of age, you become a coach. That's what I did. I come out here teaching, which is really a coach. I can't do creative work anymore in my field. I'm too old. But I can try and coach you into it. This is exactly what I'm doing. I'm trying to convince you you can do it. My error correcting codes occurred when I was 31, but my excuse is that uh, a, I was working my way through college, and B, the war tore up anything I might have done and got me involved in other things, so that I got a little late start. 31 is kind of late for a mathematician to do his best work, but probably error correcting codes are regarded my best work and never done then. But almost all, well, all the things the historians valued 
were in the first 15 out of 30 years. Now, I know more now, and I got more skilled techniques than I ever had. That doesn't count. Creativity is something else. Originality is something else. I don't know how it comes out in painting. I think in poetry, often the best poetry is fairly young. T.S. Eliot made a great big smash when he was in his early 20s and 30s. Uh, most poets get started very young. Other people get started late. Some things age is a help, some is not. Your business depends on what aspect you're in your business. You need to look at the situation, study it over, take charge of yourself and decide, I am going to be great in these ways. I can do it that lies within my ability. No, I can't now suddenly at 40 become a great mathematician, almost surely. Yes, I can do such and such. Okay, what are the things you can do which are worth doing because you've got one lousy life to live on earth, as far as I know. And if you do come back through reincarnation, you don't remember what you did the first time anyhow. So you've got one life to live here. What are you going to do with it? You might as well be creative. So I see you uh, Thursday, I hope. Thank you. Well, the lecture today is on the subject of experts. There's one definition. An expert is a person with a briefcase at least 50 miles away from home. The one I gave is an expert is one who knows everything about nothing, whereas a generalist knows nothing about everything. The expert tends to be so narrow that they know everything about that little small subject and nothing else. The generalist doesn't know anything. Now, I have been both an expert and a generalist. And I can tell you the expert wins against the generalist almost always by the following devices. One, you use a lot of jargon, which the generalist doesn't know. Secondly, you invoke basic principles in your field which may be totally irrelevant, but sound good. And you snow the generalist, and you lead him astray. So most times in an argument, the generalist loses by those two methods. The specialist does not come down to the generalist level, but rather stays at his high level and leaves the generalist losing. So it's a problem you'll face. Now, you people are by and large supposed to be generalists, so we face a different problem. Now, a fellow named Kuhn wrote a famous book, Scientific Revolutions, and he looked at the si structure of scientists and the revolutions. And he gave the name paradigm to a f name a pattern of what is going on. Typically, you are taught physics. You are taught not only the formulas, but you're taught a style of thinking about it. The style is not mentioned. It's just delivered. The kind of problems you can ask, the kind of answers you get, are all implied in this style. And people, by and large, operate within the paradigm of the field. Suddenly, there may be upsets. In physics, there were two of them, relativity and quantum mechanics. Both of them provided a different framework of thinking and different kinds of questions. Relativity opened up the whole field of uh, cosmology, the origin of the universe, and so on. It really opened up the field now, so there's lots of speculation. The difficulty with cosmology is you have one sample only, and you're supposed to account for how it happened. You haven't got a bunch of different samples, and you haven't any power to experiment. So cosmology is a very interesting science if you think it's a science. Now, the contradictions will arise in the field. In the late 1800s, there were numerous contradictions. And I told you in discussing quantum mechanics how some of these led to something else. But most people in the field will ignore uh, contradictions, will dismiss them, will do anything at all but face them, and so they go on and they don't do anything. It's only by noticing their contradictions and building them up that you have a chance of making the big change. 
It's a very difficult thing to pay attention to what doesn't agree with what accepted doctrine is because you are not popular if you bring up yes, but. For example, I brought up to you a regard to uh, thinking. That although we talk all the time about the neural system, uh, neurons storing knowledge here, there, and yon, yet one-celled animals can apparently learn, and they don't have a nervous system. Well, by and large, that is totally ignored. It may or may not be relevant, but I keep it in mind saying, well, you know, maybe what I'm being told is not the complete story. Most people in the field ignore the fact and go on thinking within their framework that the nervous system explains everything. Now, when a change occurs, it's resisted by almost everybody in the business. I can find no figures reliably of how much relativity and how much quantum mechanics was resisted. I can tell you that in uh, late 1930s, I saw in the library at the University of Nebraska quite a few books trying to claim that Euclid was a true geometry and all the things were all wrong and consequently relativity was wrong. There was a lot of relativity books written against relativity. So it indicates quite a few people did not accept relativity. And if you go back to our boy Planck about adopting quantum mechanics, there's a classic sentence of his. We didn't convert them, we outlived them. I thought about that many times. The bitterness must have been in his voice. We didn't convert them. We outlived them. That's how we won. By and large, entrenched people would not pay attention to the new ideas. This is normal process. New ideas are greatly resisted. Now, it's supposed by Kuhn that the new ideas all be triumphed. Well, yeah, ultimately, but I told you back in 1838, Dick wrote about what amounts to continental drift, and in the early 1900s, uh, Wegener wrote a whole book. But it got nowhere. It was adopted in the 40s, well after the war, or perhaps early 50s. Learned physicists wrote against why it couldn't possibly happen. Of course, they assumed the wrong model, and uh, based on the wrong model, they proved continents couldn't drift. The other one I mentioned to you is uh, genetics, metals peas. He might as well not have done it. It was rediscovered in 1900, and then people found out he had done it earlier. It is not clear that a new idea will triumph. I cannot possibly tell you how many new ideas were lost and didn't triumph because there's no way of finding them. But my suspicion is that the idea that people have that ultimately truth triumphs in science may be true if the ultimate is long enough, but it may be well past your lifetime. So the idea that what we'd like to have that we really win out early is simply not correct. It's a very great resistance when you have a new idea. Now, beyond just the continental drift because South America fitted Africa, along with the strata of rocks, there was the fact that the biologists had found the same kind of remnants of animals in the rocks in Australia, in South America, and Africa. As naturally suppose, they must have been connected together because the animals were in one place. And to account for some of these things, there were a belief that land bridges came up and sank down, so the animals get across and sank again, but there's no evidence. And there was the theory biologists had of one unified land, Pangaea breaking up into Gondwana land and so on, the geologists wanted no part of it until they finally had seen right with their own eyes practically the split in the continents and where the new land is being made right at the bottom of the oceans. And then suddenly it was accepted. When you read now and accuse them of it, oh, we always believed it, we just didn't have the final evidence. They were very, very resistant to the idea. It's one of the best ones in my lifetime of total resistance to an idea which apparently now is fairly triumphant. Most of us people believe something like uh, plate tectonics is the way the planet is built. But it could be changed tomorrow. I don't know. Now, I have one that's my favorite one. A guy went to the patent office 
and applied for a patent that would lift water more than 33 feet. Now you read in your physics book that vacuum will lift water 33 feet, no more. They wouldn't give a patent. After all, the books say he couldn't. So he brought some equipment in and put it on top of the roof. A little valve here, a little valve up there, and a short stroke pitch piston. The piston is going so fast the standing waves are set up in the column. When there's a rarefaction, water comes in. When there's a compression, the valve shuts. And when there's a compression, the water goes out the top. He lifted the water 100 feet. They had to give him a patent. But they didn't believe it because all the books said you can't lift water more than 33 feet because the air pressure outside is so much, it's only going to push up so far. But you see, he saw ingenious ways of producing rarefaction and compressions and proceed to lift water 100 feet instead. I'm not saying it's a good method. I'm saying it's typical that the patent office knew that the books all said you can't lift water. But you see, everything like that is based upon something. No possibility proof rests on one statement. It rests on a whole bunch. And if any one of them is wrong, well, and they never visualized. They thought, if I simply tried to suck the water up, yes, I can only lift about 33 feet. The perfect vacuum won't lift any further. But if I produce local vacuums, then I can. So you see one of the troubles with the expert. You're proposing to do something he knows can't be done, but you may be doing it a different way, and he cannot hear, or she cannot hear. It's a very, very great troublesome thing. Now, I said the geologists claimed everything was right, and uh, well, they had to revise themselves. Now, there's a well-known saying, if an expert tells you something can be done, it is probable it can be done. If he tells it can't be done, it may pay to get another expert who may tell you you can. Certainly my experience at Bell Laboratories has been the experts have been marvelously wrong lots of times. They don't understand the problem. I had a young fellow working for me for a while, bright, energetic, nice guy, but he didn't understand. He missed, saw, he grabbed the wrong problem, distorted the wrong way, solved it very elegantly. As a result, his work had to be undone before he could get to the right problem. The misidentification of a problem is very great. The expert sees some parts of it. See, oh yes, this looks right, that looks right, oh yes, that's nothing else than this. They force the situation into a situation they know, or think they know, and then look at it that way from their trained eyes, and they don't see the problem, has got some elements which are different. The expert simply cannot see it. It's the same words I told you earlier in this lecture, that they can't remember there are small contradictions in any theory. They conveniently forget them. Well, this guy was very nice, but I found frequently he was a nuisance. What he said was correct, but he had the wrong problem. He had the right answer to the wrong problem. And trying to find the, a reasonably good answer to the right problem is something very difficult to do when the guy is giving the exact answer to the wrong problem. It's very hard to undo that. But that's one of the things they do. Now, Kuhn and historians of science have concentrated on the big changes in science. It's my impression that the smaller changes in science work the same. There are many small changes that occur in science, and they don't get adopted frequently. For example, one that I didn't succeed with. Working at Bell Telephone Laboratories, it was natural that I would meet the frequency approach. You remember in servo mechanisms, you analyze by frequencies. You imagine in transmission, you worried about the frequency bandwidth and so on. Now, I told you earlier that I had tried to do what I observed happen for Max Planck. I tried to use the right formulas so that my calculation would fit with their beliefs in their field, not just approximately with polynomials, which is traditional. So I gradually developed a technique of approximating not by polynomials, but by frequencies, sines and cosines or complex exponentials. 
And you know how powerful four year series really is since you're more or less electrical engineers. Well, my friends in computing kidded me about it. They never listened. They never adopted it. And they nothing do. They just never did. In fact, I wrote a book which is reasonably well expounded. But most numerical analysis books now will mention the fast Fourier transform, and that's all I'll ever say about the frequency approach. Yet, by calculating that way on several occasions, because the calculation were in terms of frequency, the person for whom I produced the numbers could understand the number better than they could if it were polynomial. If I say, well, I passed that many frequencies instead of I used a polynomial degree 5. Polynomial degree 5 wouldn't mean anything. These were the frequencies we passed through that he could understand. Frequently, not always. So I led some people to small things, not as great as quantum mechanics, but to small help by trying to adjust the computation to fit the person's beliefs. Now, there's other ones. I also occasionally use real exponentials for some things. And some other fields, sometimes, and talking to a person over lunch, I found out the kind of functions they believed in. I tried to use those kinds of functions to help them find insight. Well, I didn't succeed there as an episode where I think to this day that I'm right, but uh, that idea yet not percolated into computing, although it's widely used by physicists. Now, I'm not bringing up these troubles uh, just to poke fun at things, but for four reasons why I bring up the role of expert. First, as you go on, you'll have to deal with experts, and you ought to know the faults and good parts of experts. They know a lot. Secondly, many of you will become an expert. And I'm hoping, somehow or other, that you won't be as bad as the average expert. Third, it appears to me the rate of progress is increasing and will continue to increase in your period. Therefore, there will be more need for you to adjust to new things, and more often the experts will be wrong because the situation isn't like it was yesterday. Fourth, if only I could say the right things to you, I would make you stay ahead and not let you become obsolete. That is a very sensitive point for me. I have had several of my friends, good friends, left behind because they didn't adopt new things. I told you roughly about a friend of mine who was a great analog person. I learned a great deal from him, but he wouldn't really convert to digital and he was left behind. And we retired at the same time. Him, by encouraged retirement with a little extra money, and me to go on to a different job. Later on when we met, it was clear that our attitudes toward our life careers at Bell Labs were quite different. Mine was pleasant, his was unpleasant, because he was sort of pushed out. Since coming here, I've met quite a few captains in the Navy who retired. They didn't make Admiral. Some of them were reasonably happy what happened to them, but some of them show a good deal of being disgruntled and unhappy. Particularly one who, when you get him drunk enough, he's always back in command of a flotilla off South America. He didn't like being passed over several times and retired. My problem is, how do I get you people to rise to as far as you wish to rather than being pushed out? 